Hear the word of God from Jeremiah chapter, ver- chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. This reading comes from the Common English Bible, which you can find on page 609 in the Pew Bible. The Lord's word came to me. Before I created you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I made you a prophet to the nations. Ah, Lord, I said, I don't know how to speak because I'm only a child. The Lord responded, don't say I'm only a child. Where I send you, you must go. What I tell you, you must say. Don't be afraid of them because I'm with you to rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand, touched my mouth and said to me, I'm putting my words in your mouth. This very day I appoint you over nations and empires to dig up and pull down, to destroy and demolish, to build and plant. The Lord asked me, what do you see, Jeremiah? I said, a branch of an almond tree. The Lord then said, you're right, for I'm watching over my word until it is fulfilled. The Lord asked me again, what do you see? I said, a pot boiling over from the north. The Lord said to me, trouble will erupt from the north against the people of this land. I'm calling for all the tribes of great nations from the north, says the Lord, and they will set up their rulers by the entrance of Jerusalem, on its walls and in every city of Judea. I will declare my judgment against them for doing evil, for abandoning me, worshiping other gods, and trusting in the works of their hands. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I suspect we are all familiar with the classic fairy tale, Snow White. We know its main characters, of course, there is the evil queen, there is Snow White, there's the seven dwarfs, although don't ask me to name all seven. We certainly know the basic plot, there's an evil queen who thought herself to be the most beautiful person in the entire kingdom, only to discover that there was a person named Snow White who over time became more beautiful than her. She put together a plot to kill Snow White only to meet her own demise at the end of the tale. But I suggest to you that there is an unsung hero in this story that we often forget about, a character here whose bravery and courage not only makes the story more complex, but who draws out a meaning for us in this story that is utterly relevant for us today. The character that the queen talks to all throughout the story, whenever she goes into her chambers, she even addresses this character by name. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? And that mirror never lied, even when the answers to that evil queen became very unpopular for it to deliver. At first, the mirror said, well, you are a queen. You, you are the most beautiful person in the entire kingdom. But as Snow White grew up, as she matured into adulthood, as she became more and more beautiful by the day, the answer from that mirror changed. And that answer became very unpopular with the queen. Mirrors never lie. And that's why we need people like them in our lives. People who could stand before us face to face, with all honesty and integrity, and speak to us hard truths that we need to hear, but are very often reluctant to receive. God sends us those mirrors. People who can say to us, hey, look, here's the deal, all right? You need to hear this truth, 
and I need to be the one to tell you, and you and I have to be open to hearing these words from these mirrors, like it or not, especially as we become more powerful. Because the more powerful a person gets, then the need for the mirror is much more critical. And by the way, that's not only true for each of us individuals, it's also true for groups of people, for communities, even for churches, even for nations around the world. Because the more powerful, the more wealthy, the more prestigious a community of people become, then the more it is likely that there is potential for that group of people to believe falsehoods about itself, about its own beauty and wealth and capacity and prestige. In other words, even nations need mirrors. And that was true all throughout the Bible. And that's why over the next four weeks, we are going to be listening to one of the greatest mirrors in the entire Bible. Because whenever the people of God needed to hear a hard truth that they were reluctant to receive, God raised up mirrors in the form of prophets to speak on God's behalf. And perhaps there is no greater prophet, no greater mirror than the one who looms larger than the rest in the entire Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah. And the book of Jeremiah is the longest book in the entire Bible except for the book of Psalms. The words of Jeremiah are so etched into the cultural vocabulary and the treasured language of our faith that some of our favorite hymns are based on the words of Jeremiah. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. That's Jeremiah. I sing the mighty power of God who makes the mountains rise. That's Jeremiah. That's Jeremiah. He came onto the scene at a time when the people of God needed to hear him. Jeremiah existed about 600 years before Jesus Christ, at a time when the nation of Israel was still relatively young. It had only been around for 400 years, which in the grand scheme of the age of empires is really not that much older than our country, frankly. And by the looks of it, the nation of Israel was doing really well. It was mighty in power, thanks to King David, who expanded its boundaries and raised its mighty army. Militarily, it was unmatched. It amassed great riches under his son, Solomon, pulling in treasures and wealth from all over the world. But the thing about the nation of Israel is that it was deeply divided, polarized into two separate camps, along lines of ideology and even ideology. There was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, and they were both vying for power, trying to convince themselves that they were the greater one. They were clamoring for more power and authority, and the people of God became a divided nation as they became incessantly obsessed with staring out into the kingdoms of the world and trying to convince themselves that they were the most beautiful in all the land. And that's when, in 627 B.C., God called forth a mirror, a prophet named Jeremiah, to tell him the truth. And you heard it for yourself in the scripture passage that Kelly just read. Jeremiah wanted nothing to do with this job. God said, Jeremiah, I've got this important mission and I've got this important message for you to share with the Israelites. And Jeremiah said, wait a minute, you've clearly got the wrong person. I am way too young, which he was. And I don't have the gift of public speaking, which he didn't. And he must have known that there was something about this hard message that God had him to deliver that was utterly too difficult which it was, which begs the question, what was the message that God wanted Jeremiah to deliver? And more importantly, how is that same message, the message we need to hear today, whether we want to or not? 
About two months ago, the clergy of this church spent a wonderful afternoon with a man named Brian Russell. Dr. Brian Russell is an a professor of Old Testament at Asbury Theological Seminary in Orlando. And we had him spend about four or five hours with us in the Magnolia building so that he could unpack for us the depth and the meaning of the book of Jeremiah to prepare us for this new worship series that starts today. We're so intrigued by his words that we commend him to you. If you're interested in learning more, not just about Jeremiah, but about reading the Bible faithfully and seriously. We're going to invite him back on Wednesday, July 19th to have a special workshop where you can come and hear from him how you can read the Bible for its depth of meaning. But I'll never forget the way he condensed the message of Jeremiah down to three points. He said there was a threefold message that Jeremiah had to deliver to the Israelite people. All three of these points, very difficult to hear and receive, but critical to deliver. And the first one is the word idolatry. Conveniently enough, they all begin with the letter I. And the first word is idolatry. The people of God began to worship other gods rather than the one true God. A violation of the first commandment. You remember that the first commandment that God gave the Israelites was, thou shalt have no other gods before me because I am the one true God. But the Israelites violated that commandment over and over and over again, and Jeremiah knew it. All throughout the book of Jeremiah, there is indictment after indictment about how the people have turned to false gods of their own military might, of their own economic prosperity. In Jeremiah 10, he accuses them of putting wealth over their allegiance to God. He said, you've got, you've got wealth coming from all over the place. He says in Jeremiah 10, silver from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz. You've got beautiful linens and colorful fabrics. You have begun to worship your wealth over your allegiance to God. So there's an invitation here for you and I to think about the idols the false idols that you and I worship today. What would be on that list? Maybe it would be wealth or power or family lineage or sex or fame or prestige. It's important to know that there is nothing intrinsically bad about any of those things. Because after all, Jeremiah acknowledged that there are other gods out there. There's no denying it. But what makes them idols is when we forget that there is one true God who stands above all of the other ones, who demands our loyalty and allegiance above all of the other things that we can draw our attention to. That's what makes those things idols, when they undermine our primary allegiance to God. The danger of idolatry is when we take our primary allegiance to God and reduce it down to just, just another, just one of many other allegiances that we draw our attention to. When we take our primary commitment to God and just make it one other thing that we spend our time doing or devote our life to. Let me put it to you this way. Whenever we take our allegiance to God and condense it down to just one hour on Sunday morning, and then spend the other 167 hours in the rest of our week devoting our lives and our attention and our means to other kinds of things, then all of those other things become false gods because it undermines the commandment that there is no one like our God. I'll put it to you one other way. If everything in our life is important, then nothing is important. And according to Jeremiah, there is nothing more important than our commitment and allegiance to God. That may be a hard truth to hear, but it's one that we need to receive, and it is the first part of Jeremiah's message. Idolatry. Part number two is injustice. Remember, after all, that the great commandment can be boiled down to two parts, right? 
Number one, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that is undermined by idolatry. But the second part is to love our neighbor as ourselves. And that is undermined by injustice. By disregarding the needs of those around us. Jeremiah was very clear that it doesn't matter if you have all the power and all the prosperity in the world if there is still needy people among you. It doesn't matter that you have gained all the prestige in the world if there are those in your influence who are still suffering. And time and time again throughout the book of Jeremiah, he levies one indictment after another about people who are suffering, and yet the people of Israel are doing nothing about it. In Jeremiah chapter 5, he says, quote, They know no limits in deeds of evil. They do not judge with justice the cause of the orphan to make it prosper, and they do not defend the rights of the needy. Skip ahead to Jeremiah 22, and he paints a picture of the Israelite people as a man who, quote, builds his palace by unrighteousness and his upper chambers by injustice, making his own people work for nothing, and not paying them for their labor unmistakable that the second part of Jeremiah's difficult message is the pursuit of justice, the call of social justice. Now, admittedly, that phrase, social justice, has been given a bad rap recently by certain circles within the American church who claim that the Christian pursuit of social justice is simply a veiled attempt to hide a particular kind of political agenda. But I don't see how a fair and honest reading of Jeremiah could possibly avoid the call of the church to care for the poor and the needy who need assistance, to care for those who are unjustly imprisoned in need of incarceration reform to care for those who are sick, who don't have access to affordable health care, to care for the strangers and the aliens among us who need shelter and protection. These are not partisan statements. Jeremiah would be utterly disinterested in aligning his words with any one particular political party or any one political agenda and would likely say that every political party, both blue and red and everything in between, is equally at fault for both idolatry and injustice. And frankly, to to try to squeeze Jeremiah's words into a partisan debate to try to turn it into our own favor, to advance our own partisan positions, would itself be a form of idolatry as we try to coerce the words of Jeremiah to advance our own positions second and trying to align it above our allegiance to God, to try to convince ourselves that our own political persuasions are in fact the fairest in all the land. Jeremiah is saying, And when it comes to combating injustice, we need to be involved politically without being partisan, because ultimately all people are considered equal in the eyes of God. Because if we aren't careful, if we fall for both idolatry and injustice, then the third part of his message is far too easy to slip into. The I word is inviolability. That's the final part of the message. Inviolability is a fancy word to suggest that we are invincible simply because God is faithful. That's what the Israelites believed. They began to think of themselves inviolable, which was that they were invincible against all foreign harm, because God was on their side, and that made them lazy. They stopped paying attention to the things that mattered most. 
in their worship. They were doing so inauthentically and not from a pure heart. They stopped caring for the needs of those around them. And they began to think, there is, there is nothing we need to do because after all, if God has blessed us as a people, if God is on our side, then nothing wrong could happen against us. They thought of themselves as invincible and you know what, they were wrong. And they had to learn the hard way just how wrong they were. In the end of today's scripture passage, God pulls Jeremiah over and he says, Jeremiah, what do you see? And Jeremiah answered as truthfully as he could. He said, well, God, I, I, I see a branch of an almond tree and, and I see a boiling pot. God said, no. That, that's, that's not what those are. I mean, it may look like that on the surface. Th that might be the obvious answer. But God started a journey with Jeremiah at that moment to say, the things on the surface, the things you think you see that are obvious, are actually being seen by eyes that are warped. Eyes of a person who thinks that in general the world is okay, even though it's not. Eyes that need to be open to a new reality, a new hard truth about the way the world is. But God was saying to Jeremiah, this journey I'm going to bring you along with will open your eyes, not just to the way the world is, but the way the world can become. You know, the, the title of this worship series is called Hope. Hope, it's a word we need to claim today. And it may be hard to find that hope at the outset of this series, especially given how broken this world is. But it's a word we need to hear. And it begins with this precise threefold indictment, not only of the people of God from Jeremiah, but for all of us in this country and in this world. Because hope starts here. It starts, in some ways, with hearing the truth. The first act of hope comes in hearing the truth of the way the world is. Sometimes it comes from a mirror that dares to tell us what we don't want to hear, so that we begin to receive the prescription that we need to receive. And as these weeks go by, the case for hope will build because the good news is that despite our idolatry, despite the injustice of the world today, despite our false feelings of invincibility, God has not left us alone. And we are being called to be better than we are. And that's a hopeful word. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for the words of the prophets who reflect for us deep truths from you that we do not always want to hear. We thank you that that is the first step toward a hope that will not only sustain us, but will transform us and will transform the world through us. You call us, O oh God, to this renewed commitment that begins with our own confession of our own idolatry and our own acts of injustice and our own laziness, which comes from a bad theology. We pray, O oh God, that as this series goes by, that your word would do its work in us to reveal to us new ways of seeing, to see the world for what it is and for what you have called it to be and for how we can be a part of that transformation. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our King, and let all God's people say, Amen.